have some church here this morning. We got the nice little band, and we're going to have a good time. Anytime you want to feel like you want to clap and stamp your feet or do sing, do whatever you want, we're going to have a good time. I'd like to introduce the Sunshine Jazz Band. They're going to start us off right after a, right after a prayer from Bubba. Y'all join me with okay. pra in a prayer, would you? By the way, there's a, there's a few seats scattered around. If you're standing up in the back, you can find a seat up here toward the front. Father, I thank you for the day. Ask God that uh, your presence be felt with us today, that your name be honored and glorified. Father, we're here to uh, worship and celebrate and uh, ask God that we feel your presence. Bless the musicians, bless the speakers, and Father, most of all, bless these folks who came to hear from you. Thank you so much for your love. Help us, God, to honor you with all that we do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Ready? Ready. Ready.
They couldn't carry him around. great this morning when we started thinking about this a while back 
Michael said, well, you got to help me. I, I don't do jazz. So anyway, he said, well, there's a song you could do. It's called His Eyes on the Sparrow. Yeah. And lo and behold, we, I started listening to an arrangement out of New Orleans. And this morning, I'm getting ready to come down here. And all of a sudden, my wife comes into the bathroom while I'm combing my hair. And she says, you got to hear this. And she was reading the Daily Bread. And the Daily Bread said, you know, his eye is on the sparrow, and one sparrow will not fall to this earth. <laughs> now, how does he put that together? When I started it a long time ago, and he, you know, it's amazing how God works things out and what can happen when you're trying to do good things for him and trying to help people. And this is what we do at the chapel. And this is a great audience this morning, and we're really glad you're all here. And help me while I try to sing his eyes on the sparrow, New Orleans version. Why should my heart be broken? For the Savior, he's coming to carry me home. Why should the shadows be overworn? For my Savior, he's coming to carry me home. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know. Lord, I know he's watching over me. Don't you know I sing, I'm happy. Don't you know that I sing because I'm free. Is I is on that sparrow and I know he watches watches over me
chairs right over there, guys. Good luck following that. <laughs> Just uh, again, like Dave said, thank you all for being here. This has been a fabulous ministry. You see an insert inside your bulletin, and we give God the credit always for the things that take place here. And that was written maybe a year or two ago, and finally we're putting it all together. But there are new things still happening. We could rewrite it every year. We have a women's ministry starting up, and it just it, the first one was Thursday, and what a fabulous thing. Uh, time for a bilingual Bible study with the ladies of the backside, ladies of the church. We are, uh, God is just allowing us to have very open doors here at Rio Dosa Downs Racetrack and just continue to pray for this chapel and the racetrack here. It's just a great place for you to be in the summertime and to come here and worship on Sunday. So feel welcome all the time. I want to introduce you to Steve Friskip. And Steve, you're the one that's going to have to follow that. <laughs> Come on up. And uh, Steve's from Mule Shoe, Texas. And he's also an auctioneer out of Clovis, Sale Barn. So you're going to get, we've had jazz, we've got auctioneers, we've got it all happening here. The wreck is on. Am I on? No, you're on. You're on. Okay. All right, good deal. What a nice, uh, huh, what a full house around here. I looked around a minute ago because I had something I wanted to quote you off my telephone, and I had that all pulled up this morning. Then when I got, when I pulled up, I, I, I had me one of those senior moments, and I, I said, you know, that there's no need for my telephone in here. I'll just leave that in the car. And a minute ago, I told my wife, I said, man, uh, I sure wish I had my telephone. I, I got a deal. I was going to read off my telephone and. And she said, well, you ought to run back right quick and get your telephone. And I looked out the back, and I said, honey, there's no way out of here. I, <laughs> she said, well, you remember parts of it, don't you? And I said, yeah, I'll get, I'll get the first and last word right probably. But we, uh, anyhow, man, I look around the room, see a lot of people I know. Uh, man, what a fun time we've had. Uh, I, I can't remember how many years ago. It was a long time ago I came down here and hung out with Daryl and, and uh, preached a little bit. I love this stuff right here. This is, and we just came back from a big conference, and that's what it was all about. There was some pretty high, lofty preachers, and then there was me. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, but it was all about what they, they kept bringing to the table, marketplace ministry, and, and about just being out amongst the folks, you know. I mean, this is the real America right here. This is where we live. And, uh, you know, if you're Scott picking religious, you can't go to the horse races, it's your loss. Sit home, stare at Jimmy Swaggart. I don't care. <laughs> I kind of like to go watch them run. I did make an executive decision yesterday. I think we're done betting on them. <laughs> that didn't work very good. <laughs> and, uh, I don't think the Lord had a hand in that. I think I just couldn't pick a winner. But they, uh, anyhow, uh, Love this stuff. I, I love telling everybody when they get invited to, we get invited to speak a lot and preach a lot, but uh, the first thing I like to share with, with everybody, we got a little cowboy church in Muleshoe that just kind of evolved out of a, some lawn chairs at a roping arena. Nobody asked for it. Nobody in Muleshoe wearing boots is asked to be a pastor. Nobody's asked to have a church. It just kind of happened. And so when, you, when they call me pastor, it's their idea, not mine. And, and so uh, I'm a horse fail auctioneer. That, that's how I make a living. So if you ask me what I do, I'm a horse fail auctioneer. And I serve the Lord Jesus Christ with everything I've got, walking around out here in America, tromping around our boots, watching the horses run, going to the team ropings, going to the horse fail. I got one of the best jobs in the world. I don't get to sell the race horses. Uh, I'm not quite sophisticated enough, I don't think, for that deal. But, uh, but I do all the NCHA sales, all the cutting horse stuff in Fort Worth and, and the little mess up here in Clovis. Been doing that for about 30 years. And so uh, I've had the opportunity to see some really, really nice horses. And just like yesterday, there's some really nice horses. That horse where your gray horse won the race, Johnny, I missed your gray horse because I hate to say this in front of you, but the horse that came in fourth, there was a little gray horse that had a butt about this wide. 
and he looked like something you could really rope on or something. <laughs> and, and he was the first one of the day come down that track, and I just fell in love with him sitting up there in them seats. I, mi I almost missed the whole race uh, just staring at that little gray horse. I tell people, Todd, he's been around, some of these guys have been around when I preached at the team ropings a little, or, or uh, they'll have me pray. And so if you give me the microphone, I'll kind of take my liberties every now and then. And, and so I tell unbelievers at the team ropings all the time, or everybody really, uh, you know, if you're having a hard time believing in God, uh, you probably don't have to sit in church to find him. <clears throat> You'd probably be better off to get on a bucket and stare at your horse till you figure it out. Because you know what? Ford Motor Company can't build one. NASA can't build one. There ain't nobody but God could come up with the idea that that horse would run fourth yesterday with that butt <laughs> that big. Nobody. He's in the ninth race, I believe. I love that little bugger. I wanted to run down there and buy him. And, uh, <laughs> But really, and then so you come out here and you enjoy God's creation, people working with their hands, doing what they love to do, living the Psalms 37, 4 life, that you delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. There are people in the earth who love the smell of horse manure. <laughs> we got out down here a minute ago, and one quick little old story, and I'll try not to keep you all too long today, but when I was a little old kid, my family wasn't horse people. And I don't know why I had this disease, but it, it just come on me when I was little. And we lived in town, and there was a there was a fairground about, I don't know, a mile or two from my house, and they had them buggy horses. And I'll never forget, there's an old man down there. He had to be 100 when I was a little old kid, and his name was Tuck. And they had the old wooden stall barns, and then they used straw for bedding. And that smell. I rode my bicycle down there every day. And I hung out with old Tuck and that old smell of that straw. And, and when we got out of the car a minute ago, I told Robin, I said, you know, 49 years later, man, that smells good. <laughs> you know? Man, why would anybody miss that? This is a God thing. This is a God thing. And so I want to share some things with you today that, that uh, no, I've, just, I've been jotting around all day and there's some things that are pretty heavy on my heart and man I'm going to tell you we have missed so much in religion that I, I spent a lot of time apologizing for some of the things I've done and some of the ways I've preached and, and, and different things and we miss so much you know we was laughing yesterday I tell you I had a good time yesterday and you'd be surprised how many people in my town and some of them even in my church that I'd meet up there at that window <laughs> <laughs> yeah and they'd look at you like well, at least he ain't going to be saying nothing about this because he's standing there with his money out there. <laughs> and, uh, oh, my gosh, we get so hung up on stuff. Last night, Daryl, we was going to eat, and we ended up going to the bar. I dang, that was fun. I wanted my wife to dance with me. Man, that old band was banging around there good. I wanted to get up and dance with you guys. Today. This is awesome. So we're down there eating our steak. Well, I knew everybody in there. That was, that was awesome. They just kept coming by and visiting. I had a lady come up, one time come up to me right there at church and and boy, she had something up her dress, and here she come, and she said, uh, she said, hey, when, when are you going to preach about gambling? I said, ma'am, I can. I'm a team roper. I'm, <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> we ain't going down that road. <laughs> what I should have told her was, I'll be glad to do it any time you find it in this book. Uh, there you go. There you go. But one of the things I do have something really important I want to talk to you today, and as I look around this crowd, as I heard about the sparrow this morning, you watch it here in just a second. God's been in the middle of this. This room full of Americans. It's no accident. When Daryl asked me to come down here and we kind of picked a day, this was the only weekend I had open. I didn't never, it never dawned on me it was opening weekend. Never dawned on me they were going to have them trials yesterday and Friday. Never dawned on me really about it even being Memorial Weekend. It was just the only weekend I had open, and I, and I wanted to come. And so I said, "Yeah, let's let's do it." We've been working on something really hard for the last 12, 18 months. I'm not going to quit for a long, long time. 
and out here in America, I think it's important. I think our nation is important. I think we've lost a good bit of this along the way. I think it's time to get it back. When you're my age, you realize you don't have that long to do it, so you probably ought to get busy. I think the church needs a real awakening, not on a trip to heaven or the appearance of the Lord, but the salvation of a nation for the generations that come behind us. I can lay down a very thorough biblical groundwork from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 that will absolutely prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that this United States of America was God's idea and our responsibility. I lay that down without a shadow of a doubt. This Memorial Day, this Memorial Day, what this represents, a weekend and tomorrow, by the government's choosing, tomorrow is a day of honor. And honest to goodness, all those who have died for the freedoms that we enjoy, including Jesus Christ himself, deserve more than a day of honor. They deserve more than a Sunday. They deserve more than a Monday. They deserve a, a humanity that, that actually honors them with the way they live and how we live and how we tend to what we've been given and, and all these things that God has promised us. This Memorial Day came at a really unique time, and I won't get in too deep in the history of it. But right after the Civil War, uh, it was the Decoration Day is what it was called, in fact, the South wouldn't even observe it on the same day as the North. We still had a great divide in the United States of America. I've been telling people here lately there's not been a divide in the United States of America unlike what we have now since the Civil War. We're a nation who's divided, a nation who's, who's having a really hard time. And so that Memorial Day started out as Decoration Day after the Civil War, and then, then it got moved to another day. And after World War I, they made it Memorial Day. And now here we are. The unique thing about what happened after the Civil War was something that you can read. If you ever go to the Washington Monument or the Lincoln Memorial and stand out and look at the Washington Monument on the left-hand side will be a whole wall of Lincoln's second uh, inaugural address. And in 1865, when he gave the second inaugural address at the close of the Civil War, one of the lines in the middle there kind of changed my life forever. The 16th President of the United States had a huge impact on me. He said, though they sought a different result, each one prayed to, their, prayed to their God and read the same Bible. Prayed to the same God and read the same Bible. You know the problem we've got today? We're in a civil war where both sides aren't praying to the same God. Amen. And we're not reading the same Bible. And so we're creating this great divide is, of hatred and, and bitterness is happening in, in this United States of America. And, Man, some days we don't know whether to turn left or right or cut our splinters and go straight up. I mean, who, who knows what to do next? We've got to come back to this word. When Abraham Lincoln penned that in 1865, it was a very unique thing. But, but it, it, the Bible was the, at the founding of everything in our nation. 240 founding fathers and pretty near to every dadgum one of them read this Bible and quoted things out of this Bible, those writings out of this Bible. When you talk about that spare, I'm going to jump ahead of what I had in my little old notes just a little bit. But in, seven, in 17, I don't know if it was right, 1770-something, Benjamin Franklin, they were trying to pin the Constitution of the United States, and they were in a little old building out in the middle of somewhere, and, they, and, they, and here, here's what Trump ought to do. He ought to do what they did. They boarded the windows shut and locked the doors so there wouldn't be any leaks. That's the truth. They didn't have any air conditioning. It, it was in the summertime. They're trying to pin the Constitution of the United States of America. And so they're arguing every day, and they're hearing speeches that are lasting six and seven hours at a time. And they're crammed in here shoulder to shoulder, these statesmen trying to, trying to arrive at the foundations that we stand on, the foundations that the people have bled and died for that we're honoring this weekend those foundations of our government came from God. And Benjamin Franklin stands up in front of them and he said, If the Lord God would know the falling of one sparrow, if he would know, our Creator would know that one sparrow has fallen, would he not know about a nation? And he went to Psalms 127 and he said, and lest 
God, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, unless God's in the building of a house or the building of a nation, you build in vain. If we don't begin a life of honor of the kingdom of God and Jesus Christ and a life of honor of this United States of America and those who have gone before us, how many veterans we got in here that you've served? Hold your hand up. Y'all give them big praise off them right quick. God bless you and thank you for what you've done. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's good. Amen. But let me tell you something. It's not enough to stand up and clap. I'm going to get a little rough on you now. It ain't, it ain't enough to stand up and clap. It ain't enough to walk up and buy their dinner. we got to start living it. And Christians are the ones that are supposed to be living it. We're the ones who hold the moral plumb line. We're the ones who know right from wrong. We're the ones who live in a kingdom where Jesus is king, where heaven meets the earth. This great separation thing we've been going on in church is a load of baloney, and I can prove that if anybody wants to stay long enough. I'll stay for a week if you want me to teach. I can do this forever. I can do this till Jesus comes back. This ain't hard to do. This is life where I live. We just do it. That separation thing is ridiculous. We're, we're so separated from God, and we spend our whole life trying to figure out how to get with Him. I've been with Him for 21 years, and I got saved in the cab of my pickup. I've been with Him ever since. I don't want to be apart from Him. And so if if, if, if God's not in this, if we're not honoring Him with the way we live, if we continue to walk in this separation, even like the separation of church and state, this is the most ridiculous thing. It's ridiculous that in 1947, they took three words out of a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote in 1801. He had, in 1800, he had received a letter from some Baptist group that wanted to ensure that our rights for religious expression did not only come from the government, but it came from God Almighty. And Thomas Jefferson wrote back and he said, You're absolutely right. We'll make sure and we're going to stand with it. We're going to do what the, what the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights said. We're going to, give, we're going to grant you the right for freedom of, 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 of religious expression. And we're also going to protect that right is what we're going to do. And he said, but we do realize that that comes from God Almighty. So we acknowledge that there is a wall of separation. And so for the next 150 years, they battled these issues in court. Attorneys brought that letter to the forefront. And every time the Bible stood, every time Christianity stood, finally in 1947, Emerson versus the Board of Education they take three words out of a paragraph and use the words wall of separation. They turn things around. Probably was in the ninth district, if I was guessing. And they uh, and turn things around. And from that day in 1947, we have now coined the phrase of separation of church and state. By 1962, you can't pray in your schools. Pretty soon your Bible's out of your schools. All you think, your foundational things out of your schools. It doesn't go along with anything that we've had in our American history. Daniel Webster, for crying out loud, was a great attorney, great orator of the Bible. He was the prelude to the First Continental Congress, printing the first American English printed Bibles for use of American citizens so they would know how to do liberty and justice for all. They'd know how to do citizenship. And here comes Noah Webster, the father of all education, and he prints a primer where they do uh, letters. They teach how to put letters into syllables, syllables into words, words into paragraphs, and everything is with Scripture. And our, our government okayed the printing of it to go in every school. Why would you be a science teacher in America and not use this book when all the science came out of this book? How can you teach American literature and not use this book? It's absolutely impossible to do an adequate job. And because we've settled for less than that, we're becoming a dishonorable people. We honor with our lips, not with our lives. We do it to the United States of America and we do it to Jesus. This deal was set up for us in the beginning. If you'll watch what our president just did, he did an amazing thing that I bet there won't be three preachers on the planet catch this this morning. But there are three main religions in the world that cause conflict, unity, kind of run the show, really. Oh, and by the way, Psalms 24.1 says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. 
Colossians says it is created by him, for him, through him, for our enjoyment. So all you that are waiting on the great escape, just sit here a while. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to have to paint the fence while you're here. You're an owner. And so when Donald Trump went over and walked into the Mecca of the Islamic religion and placed his foot and then moves over here to the Mecca of the Jewish faith and stands with Benjamin Netanyahu and then goes to the Vatican and Rome and the Mecca, the beginning of all Christianity, all by the God of Abraham. And we take a little detour, and I'm not going to get too deep, but I'm going to lay some quick groundwork that goes a long ways back. Do you know what was a neat observa observation in the little races yesterday, why it was so hard to pick a winner? Because those two-year-olds don't all have a solid foundation established in them yet. Some of them would leave the gates and not go straight ahead. <laughs> One of them eluded his pilot. <laughs> and so uh, we got to get back to some foundational things. And believe me, Matthew 1 is not the foundation of, crea of creation nor Christianity. Jesus has been here the whole time. He just came in a certain way for a very short period of time to fix the deal so we could be a part of it. I want you to remember the Abraham thing. Genesis 15. Genesis 12, God makes a promise to Abraham and tells him he's going to make him a great nation. Genesis 15, he takes him outside and he shows him. He said, your generations are going to be as much as this. Children are the reward. Heaven's not the reward. Children are the reward if you read your Bible. Heaven's the, the, the retirement center. That, that's, that's, that's awesome. I'm ready to go. But I'm not going to preach on heaven because I've never been there. And uh, I, I feel like I've had a slice of it from time to time. But right now, I've got plenty to do while I'm here. While I'm here. And so he takes him outside. Abram asked him, he said, What can I do for you, Lord, being you've left me childless? And he said, You're going to have as many as this. Later on, he says, As many as this and as many as this. And then he said, Now look over here. I'm going to give you all of this. I'm going to give you a land. And I'm going to give you another land. And in 400 years, your descendants will take that land. Let me help you with some theology if you've been hanging out in the wrong joint. Canaan is not having. Canaan is a piece of property that was 40 miles by 150 miles. Now it's 150 miles by 400 miles. It's a piece of land with a border. I want you to hear that. He gave Abram, who became Abraham, generations, land, which now become nations with borders. You want to know where your promise is? It's in your promised land. And it's called the United States of America. If you'll go study not the founding fathers, go study the forefathers. Go to Plymouth, Massachusetts and find a monument that's been established there that people in Plymouth don't even know it's there. And that, that monument will let you know that this book is the foundation of all liberty and justice for all. It does not happen apart from the Bible and the Christian faith. We've been given a nation that we're to preserve for the generations. We've not done very good. And now we've allowed for civility to have a great divide well you ask what's that got to do with me that's all way in genesis man i'm a i'm a new testament christian well if you're taking notes i don't, I don't have to read it to you i'll just tell you what it says you can go to romans chapter 9 and chapter 9 says that it is no longer uh the descendants of abraham who are israel it's the children of the promise then you go over to Galatians 3, and it says that by one seed, Jesus Christ, you have now become a child of the promise. Are there any born-again Christians in here this morning that Jesus has saved you, forgiven you, and marked you with the seal of the Holy Spirit? Do we have any of them in here today? We have some. Praise the Lord. Well, well guess what? Now you're part of the promise. Therefore, there's generations coming behind you and there's a promised land that's been given you and you have a responsibility here. We all have a responsibility. Man, I just don't like guys that talks about politics, government, stuff, and church. I, we just had a jazz band. We ought to all be happy, happy, happy. <laughs> Let's just all sing and go to heaven. 
Let me tell you something about going to heaven. This Christian walk isn't about where you go after you die. It's about how you left it after you're gone. Do I, should I say that one more time? This isn't all about where you go after you die. How'd you leave it after you're gone? Yeah. And to get back to the foundational things, to become part of that promise. This is God's thing. If God be for us, who be against it? And just like Benjamin Franklin said, if God's not in the building, then it's not going to do. We build in vain. If all these lives were, were given for us and for our great nation and for our Christian beliefs and everything else, and, and now we celebrate with a day, but we merely honor them with our lips. We, we, we don't continue on and we don't uh, continue to build in, in a perfect way. We don't have a, a longevity in our thinking. You see, when God made a promise to Abram, it was a 400-year promise. When's the last time you heard anybody have a 400-year plan? <laughs> no, Ted Cruz got further than anybody. He started on 2020 as soon as he wasn't going to do no good <laughs> in 16. <laughs> yeah, as soon as he lost 16, he knew he was going to 2020. Four years as far as we can get. <laughs> you want to hear of another 400-year plan right quick? When the, when the, when the Mayflower landed... At Plymouth, Massachusetts, our forefathers established a 400-year plan. That would have been at the tail end of the 1500s and the early 1600s. How many of y'all can do math? Where are we at? We're 400 years into the game. Wouldn't it be about time for some horse sale auctioneer to start running around a racetrack? <laughs> And around America, out here in the heartland, the heartland that rerouted everything last November, the heartland where real people live, real Christians live, and real Americans live, people who work and get their hands dirty, people who's had good times, bad times, they know how to be neighbors out here. And all of a sudden, we started thinking about a 400-year plan. Pretty big task. This is the only group of people I know that can handle it. You don't want to try this in New York City. <laughs> We're going to have to do it out here. Yeah. You know, after Benjamin Franklin and them boys got done, and they had called on God, and they'd stood elbow to elbow and sweated and thought and done everything they can do, they came up with a, Constitution, a constitution that says absolutely nothing about separation of church and state. Later on, a Bill of Rights that would say absolutely nothing about separation of church and state. A Declaration of Independence that says absolutely nothing about separation of church and state. But what they did do is they established three branches of government to ensure that we could be Christians here in this country and live in a godly way and raise the generations in the admonition of the Lord. What they did was ensure a constitution that would last for over 240 years and we would be the only nation on the face of the earth that has held on to one constitution for 240 years. No other nation on the face of the earth. There's many of them that have had 5, 17, 23. I can't remember which ones they all are and all those stuff. I left my phone in the car. But they... Uh, <laughs> But we're the only one. Because you know why? Because unless God's in it, you build in vain. And if he knows that a sparrow would fall, he knows that a nation would rise. Am I making any sense to anybody this morning? I'm about ready to close. I want to tell you a story that's become my favorite story. Went to Washington, D.C. the other day from a second time. First time I went, we got stopped by the law, and I didn't get to go in. <laughs> Some of y'all might have seen it on Facebook. I was with a bunch of cowboys, and I, we was all riding horses in there, long story. And anyhow, anyhow, the, the mall police come out there, and you're not supposed to ride horses over the Lincoln Bridge. <laughs> And so we didn't get to go in there, and some of them tried it anyhow, and that didn't work out so good. <laughs> so I didn't get to go on up there where I wanted to go, but we got to go back the other day, and man, I was utterly amazed. I've been a lot of church. I've been a lot of places. I don't know that I've ever been on holier ground than our nation's capital. 
And I got to listen to some men and women who are sold out for Jesus Christ who went there not to make a name but to make a difference. Very, very impressed, very energized when I came back. But my little trip through Statutory Hall introduced me to a man that I had never heard of in my life. And he's my new hero. I'm going to take John Wayne down and I'm going to put this dude up. Back in the old days, in the late 17, uh, 1700s, there was a group of men called the Black Robe Regiment. They were pastors. They were all part of our founding fathers. I'm telling you, God's been in this from the get-go now. And anybody, you can't deny it. If you want to argue it, if you're a history teacher and you don't believe this, you get in the car, come and use you with me. I'll, send, I'll lick a stamp, stick it on your hind end, send you home when I'm done with you, and you'll have it figured out. I mean, this is just ridiculous that we have gone down this road. It's kind of like the separation of church and state. This is a 60-year problem. So I told the guys in my church the other day, I said, come on, man, this is just a 60-year problem. This cotton-picking thing doesn't even have roots. We should wipe this out before lunch tomorrow. We should have this book back in our schools by next Thursday. We should have the government reading this Bible. I'm starting next month. I'm starting a Bible study on how to, how to operate government in our courthouse every Wednesday at noon. We're going to learn how to run a government by the Bible. What's wrong with that? I mean, I don't understand what's wrong with that. But I got highly energized by a man named John Peter Mullenberg. Anybody ever heard of him? Uh-uh. Man, he's the coolest guy I ever heard of. He was a pastor in Virginia, Woodstock, Virginia. And he had two churches. And he had a Lutheran church, and he was a, he was a German-speaking, he'd preach in German at the Lutheran church, and then he'd do English at the Episcopal church. So he had two churches, plus he was a legislator in the state of Virginia. So one day he's up in Williamsburg doing his thing and they'd come in there and they'd, the British had taken all their bullets and all their stuff and Patrick Henry, had, he had his shorts in the knot and he was running around telling everybody, you know, we got to go get our stuff back and this and that and other. And so John Peter Mullenberg, he came back from Williamsburg, went to Woodstock and on January 21st in uh, uh, 1776. Yeah, because it was January right before they wrote the Declaration of Independence. So in 1776, he comes back to the church. And now there's, we've, it's game on now. Them boys have been jacking with their stuff, and it's game on. And so he begins to preach. And that morning, he starts preaching out of Ecclesiastes 3. And he said, there's a time to live, and there's a time to die. And this would be his farewell speech. And as he continued to preach, he got to Ecclesiastes 8, and he said, Ecclesiastes 3, 8, there's a time for peace, and there's a time for war. And as he extrapolated his own that and then began to convey the message, he stopped in prayer, and he prayed over his congregation, prayed over what was to become the United States of America, and rather than go to the back room and disrobe as he normally would, he stood in the midst of the crowd and he began to make his way to the back and he took off his black robe. Underneath his black robe was full, <clears throat> boy, this is getting, full military uniform. He walks to the back of the room and he said, if you will not fight for your liberty, you will have none. And he walked out the door to the beat of the drums. And 300 men got up out of those seats. And they went from the pulpit to the front lines of the Revolutionary War, became the 8th Virginia Regiment, one of 17 men to be a major general in the Revolutionary War was John Peter Mullenberg, who started out in church and ended up on the battlefield. I'm just asking you today, if a man would go down here and beat his drum, would anybody get up? Would anybody risk losing a friend or maybe just a trickle of business, maybe not be so popular? Let me tell you, if God puts you there, they won't run you off. 
I've been yapping just like this no matter where I go. Hey, I started last year making everybody stand up and say the Pledge of Allegiance at the horse sale. You think that wasn't a trick? <laughs> yeah, right over at Clovis one day, I just got the wild idea. I said, I can't sing. And so I'm not going to sing the National Anthem. So I just told him I, we'd been opening in prayer for a long time. I said, you know what? Big flag right over my head. Y'all get up. Let's do this. Let's just say the Pledge of Allegiance. Well, you thought a cotton pink ghost walked in the room. I said, it's all right, I got a microphone, I know the words, you can lip sync. <laughs> and then I told him, I said, let me just explain something to you right quick. Do you know why they don't pray in your school and do the Pledge of Allegiance in your school anymore? Because you ain't been doing it at the horse sale. And you ain't been doing it at the racetrack. Now we are. All this was off limits. Church said all this was off limits. It ain't off limits. This is America. It's where I live. This is where I love. This is where I'm going to raise my kids. This is where my grandchildren are going to have grandchildren. So while I'm here, I'm not worried about going to heaven. I got saved 21 years ago. Heaven's never been an issue since then. Being about my father's business, that's a whole new deal. And right here in, the, in Acts 17, Paul is standing above a bunch of Greeks. They're all giving their theologies. And wouldn't be nothing like going to college today. Don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> I'm just telling you, there's some of them whacked. And they, uh, therefore, to the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. Do you know how many people do godly things while they're trying not to acknowledge God? They're all over the world. You can't miss God. He made this. You can cover your eyes, stick your fingers in the ears, do whatever dumb thing you want to do to pretend like God doesn't exist, but you're an idiot. I'm telling you, you you're an idiot. And uh, I mean, you can't, you can't do that. And so, uh, I mean, he is. He actually is. So you can't pretend like he ain't, you know. And so he said, the God who made the world and everything in it, since he is uh, Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. He has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell all on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in hope that they might grope for him and find him though he is not far from each one of us. There is no separation. We're just supposed to be seeking in our place where there's a border. We're a place where God made in his earth. We're his habitation. We're his glory. We shouldn't honor him with our lips. We shouldn't honor him with a day. We should honor him with our lives. The same way those are buried in Arlington Cemetery and all over the world that have fought and died for the things that we enjoy in this great nation. There's a one and the same. You can't separate the two. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of our own poets have said, for we are his offspring. We're his offspring. And there's offspring coming behind us. The deal I was going to read as I get ready to close, and I'm not going to be able to because my phone's in the car. <laughs> Darn it. The one time I needed to bring my phone to church. <laughs> but Francis Scott Key, who wrote our national anthem, man, he penned a really neat deal, and it talks about God and patriotism going hand in hand. He talks about a nation in the darkest of times who will allow the word of God to be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. She'll find her way. That through that, that nation will become a nation worthy of the name. I almost got that thing memorized, honey. Worthy of the name of a Christian nation. You want to honor those who went before us? You want to honor Jesus? And we should operate in a way that's worthy a nation that's worthy of the name Christian nation. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you have now become a child of the promise. He's promised you generations. He's promised you a nation with a border. 
He put a government in there according to Romans 13 to run the cotton picker so it all goes good. And we're part of it. And this weekend while we chase horses around and run up there and put $2 up trying to get rich, ain't nobody ever got rich off $2 anyhow. I mean, that's crazy. It's a crazy idea. I'll tell you one thing about betting $2 at a time. It's cheaper than team roping. <laughs> I promise you that. Can I get an amen out of a couple guys in it? Hey, yo. I wanted to encourage you today because we're at a very unique time. We've had the opportunity to meet some people in some pretty high places in one common denominator amongst all Christians who serve this nation with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength is that we've been given a moment of grace. We've been given a chance to redirect. If we'll put our faith in God through His Son, Jesus Christ, submit ourselves to His Word, begin to live it in this nation, our kitchen tables will be worthy of the name of Christian kitchen tables. And our nation will soon become again a, na a, a, name, a nation worthy of the name Christian nation. Our promise lies through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you'll ponder on that a little one of these days, you'll figure out all about Abraham, Isaac, and Ishmael, and you'll know why we need to keep a few bullets in the gun. You'll know why we need to stand our ground. You'll know why we need to stand with God and he'll stand with us. If a sparrow would fall and he would know it, would he not rise up a nation and know it? Hey, God bless y'all for listening to my yapping this morning. And, and uh, we love y'all and God bless y'all and God bless America. Michael, you know, they started praying. Well, about a year ago, we started dismissing with God Bless America. And we're continuing that. And we know that the only way this nation can f survive is if we continue to pray and continue to fight, like Chris said. But we also have, have to have God's blessing on this nation. Will you join with me in singing God Bless America? We do it. Let's. Do it. Michael says, "Wing it. Let's go." And after we get through here, all of you people who have to go work with your horses to get ready for races today, don't feel free to run. You can feel free to run off, but the jazz band, Sunshine Boys Jazz Band, is going to play a little more Christian gospel music, and they're going to play one just before you get ready to go so you better stand up and clap your hands but let's first sing god bless america god bless america land that i love stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above From the mountains to the prairies To the oceans white with foam God bless America My home sweet home God bless America my home, sweet home. Are you ready for those saints? Are you ready for the saints? <coughs> Let's do it. Yeah. Number oh, when the saints go marching. 